loving God, open our eyes to the beauty of your holiness. Open our ears to the message of your word. Open our hearts to the power of your love. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. A cardinal once asked Mother Teresa what he could do to grow closer to God. Her advice to him was, let God use you without consulting you first. This is the true test of your service. Later he came to her and said, you don't know what you've done to me. Every morning I wake up and I ask myself, have I let God use me without consultation? Well, I don't think the cardinal was concerned about his iPhone calendar, but clearly he was thinking about God's call upon his whole life. The real question comes down to a personal conversation, not with Mother Teresa, but with God. Am I giving to God all that I have, all that I am, my whole self, or am I saving a part of me for a better offer, a rainy day, a better set of circumstances? Our children's colorful infomercial on Children for Habitat this morning, one of my favorite places, points us in the direction of the story Jesus told about uh, giving our best to the Master. In the words of that great hymn, give God the best that you have. The children tell us that God's call for our whole life is not just for adults, but for children too, as they held up their wonderful yellow house for us to see. But the story this morning that Jesus tells in the Gospel describes three adult employees and how they handle the large portion of money that they have been given in trust to hold while the landowner is away. The shorthand version is two servants the first two made sure that they multiplied what they had been given. They held back nothing. There was no fear, uh, and they did it without consultation. No timidity, no uncertainty. They simply multiplied what the landowner had given them. And they didn't even have a step chart or an estimate of giving sheet, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> they simply believed that the owner would be pleased with their extraordinary efforts to multiply his holdings, the gift that they had been given. And they received the ultimate compliment, the ultimate blessing. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and now I will make you faithful over much. Well, then, there's the one who played it safe. He buried it in a hole in the ground. It's sort of like wrapping it in a baggie and stuffing it under a mattress. All that money represented all the holdings that the land owner had, so it was a lot of money. On first blush, the story looks fairly simple. It's kind of hold up, holds up a mirror for the full gospel story of the master returning and that we'll have to give an accounting of ourselves. Maybe you've seen the bumper sticker that simply says, Jesus is coming back, look busy. <laughs> well, I've invited another interpreter to join us this morning, and she has a particular input on giving. You know her by the late Irma Bombeck, and she's going to speak to us this morning on giving and how to use what has been entrusted to us. In one of her interviews, Irma said, my goal is to die with empty pockets. Someone interviewed me recently, she said. He wanted to know if I had saved ideas so that I could be assured of at least one column a week. We know that she all wrote for the newspaper weekly. I don't save anything, she said. My pockets are empty at the end of the week. So is my refrigerator. So is my band of ideas. 
I trot out the best that I have each week. Come the next week, I bargain. I make promises. I throw myself on the mercy of the Almighty for one more column idea in exchange for promising to be good forever and for always keeping my refrigerator clean. Irma, no holding back, was her watchword. Take all of my life, dear Lord, because I trust that you will replenish my pockets with new ideas, with sufficient income for the day, and fresh inspiration for tomorrow. It's that kind of bedrock trust that frees us to say with courage and conviction, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. I've asked one of our new choir members and one of our new church members Allie Falcone to come forward and to sing a verse of this beautiful hymn as we consider on this day how total trust in God's grace can help us empty our own pockets and to live joyfully without holding anything back. Allie? my life and let it be consecrated Lord to thee take my moments and my days let them flow in ceaseless praise take my hands and let them move at the and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Can you just hear the deep faith and trust that is embedded in this hymn of giving? It was written by a young woman named Frances Havergal who lived in England. And her only consultation was prayer. She wrote it in 1873, a young woman of 36, uh, somewhat near the age of Allie. But this is what she said about her hymn writing and about writing this beautiful hymn. She said, hymn writing is praying. For I never seem to write a verse by myself. And I feel like a little child writing. You know, a child would look up every sentence and say, and now what should I write? I invite you to sing the second verse of this beautiful hymn written by Frances Havergal. She wrote about giving our all. It's on hymn page 399 in your hymnal. Take my voice, take my lips, take my silver and my gold. I give it all to you. Let us sing together. she's back. This is what Irma says about emptying our pockets. And she speaks to the servants in the story this morning about uh, the final uh, time of giving account for what we have done with our lives. Irma says, I have a dream that when I am asked to give an accounting by the court on high, it will go this way. Empty your pockets, please. What have you done with your life? Are there any dreams that you did not fulfill? Any unused talent that you were born with 
that you never made use of, any unsaid compliments still in your pockets that you meant to distribute one of these days. If they ask me that, I will answer, she said. I've nothing in my pockets. I spent everything you gave me, and I returned just the way I came. I'm sure Irma heard, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and now I will make you faithful over much. That kind of goal puts us on our tiptoes. It, it makes us stretch. It makes us yearn, makes us reach to use up and to give away all that we have been given so abundantly by God. And so this morning, I would ask God for all of us to give us the courage to strengthen our desire to empty our pockets, to give us the commitment to give our maker the generous portion of our wealth and our time and our talent, not just to pay our bills, not just to keep this beautiful building maintained, but to give us commitment so that we can give to the world for which our Lord died all that we have, so that the world can hear the truth, can know the reality of Christ's grace, and return the lost to shelter, the least to their rightful place of joy, and the last to the front of the line. This gospel story is about servants who, without fear, acted out of gratitude. And we are so bountifully blessed. Many of us pray in prosperity and gladness. We have more than we ever dreamed. Family, friends, unsurpassed opportunities. And we too are entrusted with God's bountiful blessings. I want to close this morning with a few short prayers from children. These, these prayers were written uh, by children who were involved in our United Methodist Bishops Initiative on Children and Poverty. There was a great sadness in the land this morning over children who have been abused for 13 years. We all have heard about what has happened at Penn State and how children were ignored after they had been violated. And the football program went on and things went on as normal. And yet children were hurting and didn't know who to turn to and didn't have anyone to speak on their behalf. These prayers in this little book by children speak to the, uh, the circumstance of those children, many of whom were marginalized, were children at risk, children who were vulnerable, as all children are. And so I invite us to hear a few of these prayers that were written by third graders, a six-year-old, 16-year-olds, speaking on behalf of children through no fault of their own who are in poverty and who are vulnerable. I might say that the children who wrote these prayers met at the um, Capitol in Sacramento. I was blessed to be with them, about 500 children who met there on a school day, and they got notes from their teachers that they could uh, get credit for meeting with legislators, and so they did. We did the same thing in Nevada in uh, Carson City and met and ate with legislators there. But children learned how to speak on behalf of the poor and on behalf of their own plight. And so I invite you to hear these prayers from children. From Brendan, grade six. Dear Lord, help the needy children, and not only the children in California or Iraq or Africa, 
but all over the world. Help them with food, shelter, or whatever you see fit. Please help them, Lord. And then from Felisa, age 17. I would pray for the children to have what they need, food to eat, clothes to wear, toys, a shower. I would like to pray for the children who have been hurt in any way by people that are not in their families or friends or even people they don't know. Francis, 14, writes, Dear Lord, I pray to you for my family. We are very poor and hungry. Help us to stay together no matter how bad times may get. I know that you are there every day. I love you, Lord, and know you will hear my prayer. Thank you, Lord. We don't often get to hear the deepest yearnings and sorrow and joy of our children in prayer. And here's a picture of a little house with smoke coming out of the top. And it says just simply, Every person needs a home. Eric, age five. And then Carmen, age seven, says, roses are red, violets are blue. If you help homeless, I will too. Only a child. And then Lisa writes, I support the bishops of the United Methodist Church in making poverty and its effect on children a priority for change. And then another one with a purple daisy. Please, God, help the poor with home and shelter and hunger. Another writes, give them clothes, help them buy peanut butter sandwiches, give them hugs. And that's a group prayer. And finally, dear God, I need and others need help. Foster parents are not the people you think they are. It makes you wonder what's happening in the life of Jamel, who was 17 with this, when this was written. And I close with this one. God cries when there are people in need. Potential is lost when youth are left behind. Tears should not inhibit action. Kristen age 16, and Brendan, grade 6. These come from the heart of our children, even if we don't know them. They are our children. Even if we don't know the ones in Penn State, they are our children that God has given to us, entrusted to us for safekeeping, for their joy, for their fulfillment, for their potential. I know that you pray with me for these children that have been abused over these years, and we lift them into the light of God's grace, that they may begin to know that there are so many people that care about them, that are praying for them. We pray that God will use us in some way to restore the peace and the joy and the life with which they were created. Let us sing the final verse of Take my life and let it be consecrated. Francis Havergal's hymn of giving as we consider our own giving for the life of children and all that God loves. Let us sing. Mm -hmm. 